and drinks in the back over there. Uh, there's plenty of stuff there to eat, and I'm trying to get rid of it, so please, please eat it in the back there. Um, there's probably going to be a couple of stragglers coming in, but we might get this started on how long David wants to speak. Um, first of all, my name is Kevin Zickerman. I am Vice President of Amnesty International here, which is one of the sponsors. Um, also, Treasurer and Secretary of another sponsor, Environmental Law Society. And we also have um, the Calvary Faith Network for Peace and Justice co sponsoring this event, as well as the International Training Office here at NIU. Um, so, again, feel free to get up and get uh, items. Um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Steve here with the uh, the Calvary Faith Network for Peace and Justice. And then I believe Ray is going to be introducing our speaker, uh, David Crash. Uh, craft from the Nuclear Energy Information System. Um, you should be very entertained tonight. So, thanks, Kevin. Um, the just a little bit about the Interfaith Network. Uh, the Interfaith Network, yep, the Calgary Interfaith Network for Peace and Justice, began in I believe about '85 or '86. Uh, we began by uh, fighting U.S. policy in Central America. There were three civil wars going on, and we, uh, we challenged U.S. policy in regard to those. Since then, we've been, been involved in a variety of other peace and justice issues. And uh, on a personal note, um, I remember a discussion on national public radio about why it's taking so long for the federal government to figure out what to do with nuclear waste. The year that that took place, 1970. And they were wondering why it took so long then. And we still haven't figured it out. I, I expect we'll talk about some of that today. And then um, I wanted to uh, turn it over then to uh, Dr. Ray Tai for introducing our speaker from the International Student or uh, International Training Office. Thanks, Steve. I'm uh, Ray T with the International Training Office. I was trying very hard to get a lot of student support for this. And it's very hard to sell the nuclear issue as an environmental issue, especially even if it's the uh, environmental month, the Earth Day. And I would like to thank uh, the two organizations, the College of Law, Amnesty International uh, College of Law, through Kevin Zinkman, and also the Environmental Legal Society, the Environmental Law Society, Megan, she couldn't be with us today. And finally, I got my office to approve my request that this be our co-sponsored project, without which we could not have the official stand for our uh, publicity purposes. And I'm glad some non uh, uh, people who are not members of the organizations are here. And I'm sure we'll have very interesting questions. My two friends from the Ukraine are here. So we'll have questions about Chernobyl, for sure, and others. So uh, our main speaker for tonight is the director of the Nuclear Energy Information Service, which is a non-profit organization committed to ending nuclear power. And they have three main objectives. The first is to educate, activate, and organize the public on energy issues. The second is to build and mobilize grassroots power and nonviolent opposition to nuclear power. And the third, to advocate sustainable and ecologically sound energy alternatives. There are many things you can get in terms of information from uh, his office, the NEIS, the Nuclear Energy Information Service. Uh, you can invite them to come to your classes, to special events, the Speakers Bureau, the VC access to their information, as well as research database. Uh, I know you are dying to hear our speaker give his speech. Please welcome David Kraft. tonight. Um, a couple of things, a little business out of the way. Uh, this is uh, rather typical for an audience on nuclear issues, is my experience in about the last 30 years. Uh, so there should be no feelings, you know, don't feel bad about the turnout or anything like that. It's very typical. We did a, a free film show in downtown Chicago, Chicago filmmakers, on a nuclear film not too long ago. Uh, they usually get 50 to 60 people to see the film for free at uh, Columbia College. And when we started the movie, three people were in the audience. I was one of them. And 
by the time we started the discussion, we had ballooned up to eight. So um, this is the nature of this issue. This is the nature of the consciousness of this nation, perhaps even internationally, on this issue. So no need for apologies. It's clear that right away. Uh, second thing, um, I, in my enthusiasm to get here and be with you and, and get going and whatever, I left my presentation at the cut. So uh, this is a first time presentation. I can follow along on the slideshow, so it's going to be a little ragged because it's not all up here yet. I've done it a few times. So you, you're the virgin audience. You, know, you get to be the critique of how good a show this is. Now, when I accepted the opportunity to speak here on Earth Day 43, uh, Ray sent me some guidelines, and Seal Meyer sent me some thoughts, and uh, people wanted me to cover legal aspects and law issues and maybe radioactive waste and possibly Korea, and then there were about five or six or seven other things that we were supposed to cover in an hour. So I had all this on my desk and I was thinking, maybe I should finish my calculations for the unified field theory first. <laughs> so this is what you're going to get. You know, it's a little raw, a little ragged, but I think it'll fit the bill. For me, uh, this is not as important as the question and answer session. It's what you want to get out of this tonight that's important. So it, it'll be your thoughts, your discussion, your question. That'll be the meat of what's happening. What I'm going to do is lay out what we see are the important, the salient issues facing Illinois, the nation, perhaps the world on some of these nuclear matters. Uh, I'll try and get you up to date on some of the, the current legislation and things that are going on. And from there, hopefully, we'll launch into the question and answer part and we'll make all these pieces fit tonight. So first off, happy Earth Day, day 43 and all, right? Yeah. yeah. They all celebrate to do something besides come here. What a darn Anyway. <laughs> It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Actually, a lot of my presentations have a subtitle of the Davy Downer Show because a lot of times when I come in and, and talk, it is about very disturbing issues, difficult issues. So we'll try and uplift you by the time the evening ends as much as we can. Because we'll talk about, if not nuclear, what else should we be doing? So, birthday 43. First one, 70 years ago, President Richard Nixon was in office. And people might not realize this, but Richard gave us things like the EPA, the Clean Air and Water Act, Earth Day, first one, started by uh, Gaylord Nelson of Wisconsin, a senator. And at the time, he was uh, dialoguing with a graduate student, a guy named Dennis Hayes, who wanted to put this environmental event together. And so Nelson asked him, well, how soon do we get this thing going? And Nelson and, and Dennis said, well, my spring break is between here and here, so how about April 22nd? So this is the significance of spring break. The deepest spring break for Dennis Nelson 43 years ago. No other significance than April 22nd, I promise. So um, the other interesting fact, though, about the, the, this being uh, Richard Nixon's dynasty at the time, was he was very, very excited about the prospect of bestowing a thousand nuclear reactors on the coasts of the United States by the year 2000, which of course would give us unlimited electricity, too cheap to hear, and all that other stuff that you've ever heard about nuclear power. But as we, as many of you know, not all of you know perhaps, we never made it to a thousand. In fact, we peaked, I think, at 105 or six, and we've been sliding down ever since. So I'm gonna give you a little background on the current status of Here's something I want you to know about Dennis Hayes before we move on here. That, uh, you know, that, when he first started Earth Day, he was kind of green behind the ears and stuff. But uh, after a while, he created a movement out of this. And internationally, Earth Day is celebrated everywhere. Never ever, during the whole course of these Earth Day things, did he ever select a theme for a, un for a universal Earth Day, except in 2001, when he declared that this will be the clean energy Earth and who did Chicago pick as its corporate sponsor for the Clean Energy Earth Day? But Commonwealth Edison Exxon Corporation, which had fought every clean energy initiative ever to hit Springfield at the time. 
So I think Dennis kind of got the message back then. Uh, if you can't read this from the back, I did encourage you to come up. Remember, I told you to cover your eye and read. If you can't, I'll read it to you. Dennis had some words of wisdom uh, at Earth Day 40 about nuclear power. He said, we've been offered a lot of false promises and greenwashing during those years since the first Earth Day. And we've acquired what Hemingway called the indispensable crap detector. Only the most gullible are buying what the nuclear industry is selling. The climate clock is ticking. Let's not hop from the climate frying pan into the nuclear fire. Let's not waste more time and money on an outdated nuclear technology that has already flunked the market test. So that's the founder of Earth Day's take on nuclear power. You may have your own, and by the end of the night, it may change one way or another, but just want you to know how the founder of Earth Day feels about it. So here's some basic info for you. Worldwide, we're talking about 440 reactors. So even worldwide, we didn't reach Richard Nixon's goal of 1,000. And this has been, you know, since the late 60s. So this is not in any short time span. This is the whole deal all along. Uh, currently, there are about, as we see here, 68 reactors under construction. And uh, that gives us about 372 gigawatts of power. A gigawatt is 1,000 megawatts. Each reactor these days going online is roughly 1,000 megawatts. And 1,000 megawatts of power, maybe about a million plus homes. So that gives you some standard of reference. The two Byron reactors down the road here, they're about 1,100 megawatts a piece. So you're talking about two and a half million homes are powered roughly by those two uh, reactors. Um, that gives us 13% of the world's electrical output. And a, a number that may just seem like a statistic, but it has some crucial importance on safety, is that if you add it up all the time, all of those reactors were ever operating, that adds up to about 15,000 reactor years of operation from the very beginning of the nuclear age till now. And I'll come back to the safety significance of that later. So let's go to the US. We've got 104 reactors in operation now. And in the United States, we use two different kinds. There's uh, one version is called the pressurized water reactor, mostly built by Westinghouse Corporation. We've got about 69 of those. The rest are what are called boiling water reactors. And those were largely manufactured by General Electric Corporation. And they were among the earliest designs and earliest reactors put online here. In fact, uh, the four, four of the oldest reactors in the country are here in Illinois. Two are at Morris, the Dresden nuclear facility, and two are on the Mississippi River, the Quad Cities facility. And I singled them out because those four reactors are the exact same design and slightly older than the three reactors that melted down and exploded at Fukushima, Japan, two years ago. Uh, let's see, there's only one reactor currently under any kind of meaningful construction in the United States. There's a plan to build three more, possibly five more. We're not quite sure. It's going to depend on how the funding goes. But it looks pretty grim on the funding front. So we really don't have a lot of new stuff in the pipeline. This gives us about 101 gigawatts. That's about 19% of our electrical demand. Uh, demand is an interesting word. Uh, engineers and politicians and everyone talk about the electrical demand of the people of the United States. I don't know how you feel about that word, but I know what my grandmother would say about it. Uh, people who get too demanding should really be sent to bed without dinner and should learn a little bit of humility. And in a sense, that's one of the problems we have with electricity here. We take it so much for granted that we abuse it just like any good addict would. And uh, we waste a lot of it. In fact, even though we get 19% of our electricity from all of those 104 nuclear reactors, four separate studies beginning in the year 2000 to the year 2010 concluded that we waste somewhere between 24 and 45% of all the electricity we generate. So in other words, we are wasting, just through inefficiency, poor energy choices, uh, not waste, uh, roughly twice the entire output of the entire nuclear industry of the United States. If we would just get a little bit smarter, we wouldn't need those reactors quite likely. In fact, uh, I use the analogy of a farmer who has a bucket he brings it out to the pump, and the bucket's leaking like a sieve. He's pumping, and the water's coming out. 
And a salesman comes up to him and says, Farmer, I can solve your problem. I'll sell you a bigger pump. That's exactly what the nuclear industry does to the United States. We have an incredibly leaky bucket, and they're perfectly willing to sell us bigger pumps. But give a lot inside. I should also point out that even though we have 104 in operation, we have 28 closed. 20 of those are commercial size, meaning they were operated by some utility at some point. The others are small research reactors that were scattered throughout the country for a variety of purposes. Here's a, a rough map. It's kind of, might be kind of hard to see from the back again. Uh, it is color coded, and what's significant here is if you can see in the back there, the light blue dots are the older reactors in the country. And the dark green dots are the newest reactors in the country. So we seem to have a sort of geriatric problem approaching with the American nuclear industry at this point. Many of them have already reached, not, not many, but some of them have already reached their 40-year licensed uh, age span. They, many, in many cases, they were granted an additional 20 years of operation but uh, the point is, uh, they're kind of old. I don't know how many of you came here tonight in your 1948 Fords. Please stand if you did. <laughs> uh, that's essentially what we're getting down to with the uh, nuclear reactors in this country. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, now you do replace worn out materials and you know, machines and stuff like that. So I'm not trying to be too silly here. The point is, though, these things are getting old and they will break. We have stressed the wrong way. You are in the nuclear heartland, my friends. Nuclear Illinois, we are the largest user of nuclear power in the United States. We have 14 reactors here. 11 of, our, of them are operating and three are closed. If we were a nation, we would be number 13 in the world. China just beat us out recently, mm. so don't take it too hard. But, uh, we will persevere, I'm sure. But, the problem with having the most reactors is we also create the most nuclear waste. In fact, we have about 8,600 tons of high-level spent radioactive fuel sitting mostly at the reactor sites where they created the fuel. So all of those seven sites with 14 reactors have specialized ways of storing the waste on site, waiting for some time in the future when the United States will develop a permanent geological disposal facility, which we do not have yet. And again, don't feel bad about that, because nobody else does either. You know, we're 60-some years into the nuclear age, and now they're figuring out they need a bathroom. I don't know, I, I was growing up in Chicago, I, I was stunned tonight, a high school classmate who I hadn't seen since high school showed up and introduced himself. Mm -hmm. When we were at Lane Tech in Chicago in the 60s, they were building the John Hancock Center on Michigan Avenue at that time. I used to hang out at Oak Street Beach. And I didn't realize it then, but I'm watching this thing go up, and I'm really impressed. And about 30 or so years later, when I started this group, another thought occurred to me that at the same time Hancock was being built, a lot of those Illinois reactors were being built. And it finally clicked with me. What if they built the John Hancock building without bathrooms? <laughs> <laughs> and knowing that they would have to tear it down in 40 years. What would it look like? Would they have gone ahead? I'll let you decide. You know? The U.S. Senate, I believe it was the Senate, but not now. Uh, they did that when they constructed the last Senate office about 30 years ago. They got it finished and realized they left that all Okay, so this is the American know-how. <laughs> but uh, so that, that's a problem, you know, that we have this industry, and it's not just a, a, a U.S. problem. This is an international problem. Nobody has an environmentally acceptable, permanent disposal uh, system in operation for high-level radioactive waste all of these decades in the nuclear age. That applies for weapons as well as commercial spent fuel. So, nobody built the bathroom, and I see a lot of silver and gray hair in the audience, so this is not really directed so much to you, but the rest of you are in for it. But unfortunately, we're passing you know, the bucket full of manure to you to figure out what to do with for the next 10,000 years or so. We didn't do our job, and I apologize. Uh, after 9-11, we added another feature to this map, uh, something very unique to Illinois. It's called O'Hare Field. 
Because we figured <coughs> if the worst pilot on record in aviation history who couldn't even fly a single engine airplane could get a hold of a sophisticated twin engine 757, execute a 180 degree turn, and go for a mile at treetop level and hit the third floor of the Pentagon, we figured there's a possibility some idiot might try and ram an airliner into a nuclear plant. So that's why we put O'Hare Field on the map and drew lines out from that. And you can pick up a copy of the map here mm -hmm. and display it before you leave tonight. I have the autograph for you if you really want. The idea is, though, every one of the reactors in Illinois, and even out of Illinois, across the lake in, in western Michigan, are less than 30 minutes of normal looking flight time to O'Hare Field, which is, depending on the year, either the busiest or the second busiest airport in the world. 3,000 flights or more a day. And I, when I used to fly to Germany, I recognized that, oh, a fully loaded outbound airliner leaving O'Hare flies over the west coast of Lake Michigan and down below me was the former Zion nuclear power station, which has about 1,000 tons of spent reactor fuel sitting there waiting for disposal. When I came back from Germany, the flight path was right in between two sets of reactors on the Michigan coast of Lake Michigan. So, Yes, you know, there are no fly zones and there are interdictions and the Civil Air Patrol will steer them away, but they're only going to have a couple minutes to do it if somebody really gets serious about taking out one of those reactors using the airline. So, I hear there's some lawyers here tonight, so I've got to do the law somehow, so I will do that. What I want to do to start out with is give you the kind of legal and regulatory framework because many people who I encounter in audiences and presentations don't share my opinion about nuclear. They feel that we have a government that's responsible, that's been in place over 200 years. They've set up a commission, a nuclear regulatory commission that regulates the nuclear industry, takes care of safety matters for the United States, and they feel comfortable about that. Uh, I'm afraid I may have to shake that uh, image up a little bit tonight, but at least I want to give you the on paper framework for how things are supposed to go. We call that the platonic form of nuclear power. Those of you, any UFC graduates here at the University of Chicago? Okay. You all know about platonic form versus real life? Okay, the platonic form is the ideal. You know, it, It's conceptual, nothing goes wrong. It's the perfect form of something. And the rest of us have to muck around here in reality. And so, so we're gonna go over both of those. So, these are the various laws and guidelines, rules, agencies that deal with nuclear power in the United States. The first and most important is a part of the Code of Federal Regulations, that's CFR, Title Number 10. It's about this thick, you know, it goes on for somewhere around 1,100 pages. And that particular title in the Code of Federal Regulations deals primarily with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. This is the agency that the United States government has set up to regulate nuclear power. And uh, you'll find everything in there, transportation, waste, construction, safety, uh, the ability of the public to get involved in the process. And that's a kind of a revelation in its own right, because in that 1,100 page tome, the 10 CFR tome, there is the ability for the public to ask the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to either temporarily or permanently close a nuclear plant uh, in case of what they perceive as a safety issue of, of significance. Out of 1,100 pages, the public gets two paragraphs to do that. So there seems to be a bit of an imbalance going on here to start out with. And I would point out that I do not recall a single instance over the last 40 some years where our 2.206 petitions the section of 10 CFR have been accepted by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in their entirety. Uh, so the US NRC is, by law, supposed to be responsible for safety issues at nuclear power plants. They are preeminent power. States have to defer to them. Uh, even Congress uh, defers to them. And that often happens with federal agencies. Radiation standards, though, are set by the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, 
uh, they have different standards for water, they have different standards for air, for worker exposure, for exposure to the public uh, as part of the various nuclear processes. So there is sort of a tension that sometimes gets built up between the two. Usually they work together. Uh, the states have been protected somewhat by Article 10 of the Bill of Rights. You know, if it ain't in writing, if it is law that the feds do it, the states have power over that. So where can states intervene in the nuclear issue, in the nuclear process? It turns out very few areas. They do not have any ability to either overturn, override, or intervene other than through those other petitions on safety issues, because that is totally the domain of the nuclear regulatory. They can ask, they can suggest, they can observe. In fact, at the Byron Nuclear Station down the road, there are at least I believe two resident inspectors from the state of Illinois on site at all times, as well as two federal NRC inspectors on site and on call at all times. But the difference is the federal NRC people can order the plant shut. The state of Illinois people can pick up the phone and call the governor. That's it. They just they report, they observe. No jurisdiction on safety related matters. However, the states do have preeminent authority on the issues of water use, particularly through what's called the NPDES permitting process. And I always mess up the alphabet soup. It's the National Pollution um, Pollutants. Oh, I always mess up. Anyway, it deals with uh, putting pollution in the water. And it's just the regulatory method for that. I'm sorry, I forgot the acronym. Uh, but so, all that water from the Rock River that goes into Byron has to be first okayed by the state of Illinois. And the water coming out of Byron, the hot water that gets just discharged back, also has to meet certain state standards based on these NPTES permits that are issued. So that's one jurisdictional area that the states have control over. Second area is the setting of rates, electric rates. Years ago, Utilities used to be little fiefdoms all over. They, they had a definite carved out geography that they were required to serve by law. No competitors could come in and sell their electricity there, but they had an obligation to serve every single customer in their fiefdom. Uh, that's been changed over the last decade and a half, but almost two decades now, with the so-called market approach to uh, selling electricity. And so this authority that the states have to set rates has been somewhat eroded it's, it's uh, currently in Illinois, you'll find language to this effect in the Public Utilities Act and specifically the duties of the Illinois Commerce Commission. Secondly, though, uh, if you also go to the Public Utilities Act, there's a section in there that requires that any kind of a power plant, gas, windmill, whatever, has to meet certain criteria to serve a public necessity. So they have to get this permit from the ICC, from the state, certifying that this power plant is necessary, okay? And that uh, that's what the certificate of necessity is all about. So that is a state uh, authority that the feds can't override. And in a very bizarre kind of way, it's a very good thing that it worked out this way because what happened was uh, states like Illinois were getting very concerned that there was no place to dispose of the high-level radioactive waste. But the federal government was still authorizing and constructing more and more power plants. So one of the ways that the states ingeniously worked around this potential safety issue was to rational 